Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Travis. I'm the president of John Jay College, and it's wonderful to see all of you here on our campus. I have the uh, honor of being asked to moderate this next panel at the American Justice Summit. The title of the panel is um, provocative. It's the culture of punishment. and asks the question embedded in the subtitle, it doesn't have to be this way. So over the day that we've been together, we've had a lot of conversations where the question of punishment, punitiveness, has come up uh, in the panel discussions. Started with, with Tina's uh, talking about the phenomenon of mass incarceration, why that has happened, why we have so many people in prison, which used not to be true in this country. We then talked about jails, we talked about the way we treat the mentally ill. We had a brief discussion about school discipline, another expression of punishment. Uh, we then had a discussion about immigration detention, excessive fines, the findings of the Justice Department in Ferguson. So the thread that runs through all of the discussions that we've had uh, today is this very profound question, why is it this way? Why is it this way in our country? So just to frame it as a question is, why is America so punitive? Or why is America now so punitive? Have we, have we always been so punitive? What is it about our country, our character, our culture, our history, our experience uh, with issues of race, our experience with immigration? Why are we this way? So it's a big question. So the panel is not going to help us answer the question, they're going to help us think about the question so that we can leave here today just with some better insights. This is now a conversation that's underway in academia, a lot of writing on this question about punitiveness in America, uh, trying to measure this, so scholars are looking at it in this way. But our hope is that uh, this is a realization so that at this point in the summit, we're starting to tie some pieces uh, together. So we are so fortunate to have the panel that's on the stage with me today to shed some light on this uh, question, this phenomenon about punishment. Must it be this way? And we're going to go pretty deep. We're going to go deep inside of the prison experience uh, with two individuals on the stage with me who have lived parts of their lives, years of their lives, in American prisons. Uh, in one case, we'll have a first-hand uh, discussion of uh, life in solitary, which we talked about briefly uh, this morning. We also have two uh, experts, corrections experts. Uh, I'll introduce everybody in a second, but one of them is a psychologist, the nation's preeminent psychologist, understanding the effects of incarceration, in particular, uh, the effects of, of solitary. And to help us step outside of the American experience, we have a European expert. Uh, one of the leaders in uh, the corrections uh, profession in Germany, uh, who is here to help us think about a point of comparison, a point of reference, so that we can take on some tough questions about our own history uh, and culture. So my hope is that we'll ask uh, the first uh, presenter to help us really paint the picture of an experience that some of us have had, some of us have not had, but it's so important for us to all to understand, and that's life inside uh, a prison. So the first person I'll call on in a second after I've introduced all of them uh, is Ronald Simpson Bay. Ronald is uh, somebody known to many of us. He's actually a graduate of Just Leadership USA and now works for them, organizing an alumni ne network of formerly incarcerated individuals around the country. He spent 27 years in prison in the state of Michigan, he then took it upon himself to uh, become a familiar with the law, helped find a way to get his conviction overturned. Today, he's a free man, an advocate for justice, spent time with the American Friends Service Committee, and now works at Just Leadership USA. Seated to my immediate left is uh, and Andrea James. Andrea is uh, somebody who, in her professional life, is a lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer, real estate lawyer. Uh, and then was convicted of a crime that sent her to federal prison for two years. She has come out of that experience as, a, uh, as an advocate for the perspectives of women and mothers on the issues of mass incarceration and justice reform. She has created an organization called Families for Justice as Healing. I love the title. And she is now affiliating with a national association that's advocating for the perspectives of women. 
And at the, uh, in the middle here, seating next to Andrea, we have Jorg Jesse, who uh, serves as the Director General of the Prison and Probation in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, which is in northeastern Germany, if you know your map, former eastern Germany. Uh, Jorg was our host when a number of us uh, went on a visit to Germany, sponsored by Vera and John Jay, uh, to look at prisons and provide a comparative uh, perspective. You've seen some press about that, and 60 Minutes is about to do something on our trip there. Uh, Jorg is also very active in uh, prison issues uh, throughout Europe. We're very fortunate uh, that he is here. And finally, I want to introduce a good friend and close colleague of mine, Craig Haney, who is a distinguished professor of psychology and presidential chair at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And as I said before, is, uh, I think, the preeminent national expert on psychological effects of incarceration and particularly solitary confinement and was a member of the National Academy panel uh, that I chaired. So what a wonderful group we have. Please join me in just thanking them for coming and then we'll get right into it. So, uh, Ronald, uh, we heard this morning a very uh, poignant um, description of, of life in immigration detention using the word icebox. Uh, you probably have your own language for the experience uh, that you want to share with you, but just, you spent many years uh, in prison, many years in solitary, just, what's, what's a day like? Just help us imagine your life uh, to give some context to this discussion of punishment and punitiveness. Thank you. Good question. Thank you for inviting me here. I'd like to first say that time in prison in, uh, in and of itself is challenging beyond belief. But time in solitary is just like, it's mind-boggling. People lose their minds in solitary. Imagine having everything in your life regulated to the minute. What time you can get up. What time you can go to bed. What time you eat how much water you can use when you go to the bathroom, what, how many days you can use the shower out of the week. Sunlight is even regulated in solitary. In Michigan, they'll, they'll close the shutters so you don't even get sunlight. Solitary confinement is one of the most dehumanizing attributes of prison. That's above and beyond all the other ones. Solitary confinement in and of itself is a unique form of torture that we should try to eliminate at all costs. Thanks. So, and, Andrew, uh, if you could also uh, share your thoughts, perspectives, insights on your time in prison and um, just help us understand your perspective as a woman as a, and as a mother. I went to uh, prison after uh, more than 22 some odd years of working within the criminal legal system as uh, uh, all the way from a youth worker working on the streets to a, tr a trial lawyer or a criminal defense lawyer and a real estate lawyer. And I have to tell you, there wasn't much that anybody could tell me about how broken that system, this system is, how much restructuring, complete dismantling and restructuring that needs to be done until I became an incarcerated woman and walked into the prison in, in the federal prison for women in Danbury, Connecticut, where I served a 24 month sentence. And my experience pales in comparison to the women that that I was incarcerated with, uh, many of these women just did not need to be incarcerated. They did not need to be in prison. The majority of these women were poor. They were women of color. They uh, uh, were mothers. And they had been separated due to these very long, outrageously long draconian sentences um, uh, due to um, very uh, distance-related drug charges. Many of them were there for conspiracy. They weren't even there for charges that directly implicated them in selling drugs. And they received very long sentences that had them separated from their children. Um, I was a lawyer. I left my children standing in the parking lot with my son and my, uh, I'm sorry, with my husband and my um, parents and my older children. Uh, the, uh, the women that I was incarcerated with weren't anywhere near so lucky. The last time they laid eyes on their children may have been six, seven, eight years ago, and that was after a drug raid or something where the last time they laid eyes on them, they were looking out of the back window of a law enforcement vehicle as, uh, s and watching some other um, entity take their children away. That is incredibly heartbreaking. I was in the federal system. Women are there uh, who are thousands of, mi of miles away from their children. Their families do not have the means to bring their children to see them. So it was incredible to feel, to feel the heaviness 
within that women's prison um, from the heartbreak uh, that the women were experiencing. On top of these extraordinarily long, unfair, unjust sentences, they also had the sentence of being separated from their children. Mm -hmm. Andrea raises such an important uh, point when we think about the punitiveness in our, in our country and how uh, we have put so many more people in prison and jail, uh, that there are these ripple effects outside beyond the individual who's incarcerated. And they, they're the first um, concentric circle there to be affected are children and loved ones, partners, spouses, parents. Ronald, just give me your, your sense to, to continue this thought about uh, relationships with families uh, and the outside world uh, during your uh, time in, in prison in, in Michigan and what you experienced and how you talked about it with, uh, with others who were incarcerated with you. I'd like to uh, kind of speak on, spin off that, the ripple effect you just talked about. Let me put in a little context. I went to prison in 1985 at 27 years old for a crime that I did not commit. And I subsequently got it reversed by my own work and the courts finally reversed my conviction. I was released. However, during that time, on uh, Father's Day 2001, I had been in prison about 16 years at this time. I had four children, a son and three daughters, and I'm waiting for a visit from my children. Dad, we come to visit you today, and I'm all excited, I'm, you know, I'm happy. You know, a visit from a child in prison is like, like manna from heaven. So I'm sitting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. No one shows up. About four or five o'clock in the evening, I start calling around, what's going on, what's going on? And I come to find out, my ex-mother-in-law said, you haven't heard of Ronnie? I said, no, what happened? He said, your son, Ronnie, been shot and killed by a 14-year-old juvenile. My son was 21 at the time. In the streets of Flint, a 14-year-old juvenile killed my son. So the ripple effect was off the, off the charts. But in response to that, you know, I, I had been in prison long enough and matured enough to know that, you know, seeking revenge was not the answer. So I sought to forgive this child and to give him a second chance. I advocated for him to be treated as, an, as a juvenile in the juvenile system instead of an adult because I knew he would get the assistance he needed and the second chance he deserved through the juvenile system. So we want to come back to this theme uh, that we've uh, surfaced here. Uh, your work with an organization that has healing in its name, your work uh, now and uh, after that awful incident uh, on behalf of a, a different response to uh, to crime. But let's just stick for a moment with the, the issue of the effects of incarceration and particularly of, of solitary. Uh, so Professor Haney, uh, just from your research and your scholarship over many years now, you've been looking at the uh, damage caused by incarceration generally and particularly uh, by isolation. So, it's hard to talk about this with the objectivity of a scholar because it is so deeply human what we're talking about, but just give us some top of line assessment of, of what your research has shown over the years. Let me preface this by saying that um, when I talk about some of the effects of prison, I don't mean in any way to pathologize the people who experience these effects. I'm pathologizing the environments that they've been forced to adjust to. But they are environments that have effects. They have, uh, in, in many instances, harmful effects. So Glenn Martin talked a little earlier today about meeting the best and the brightest in prison. And you're hearing from, from mm. some of them on this panel. Mm. Thank you. But what is best about them and what is brilliant about them was not really fostered in prison. They are the people you see and you heard from and you'll hear from later, and they're in the audience in spite of, not because of, what happened to them in prison. Um, prison is a profoundly dehumanizing environment. Prisoners are treated in, as less than human. They are degraded by the procedures, by the, by the physical architecture, by the rules and regulations to which they are subjected. Not even really treated as less than human, but sometimes treated as inanimate objects to be moved around and, 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 and harmed without, uh, without a thought being given to the reaction or the consequence on the person. Prisons are profoundly uh, depriving environments. So people 
The courts have ruled that people who are in prison have the right to the minimum necessities of life, by which they mean food, clothing, and shelter. But they most decidedly don't mean the kinds of things that sustain the human spirit or the human psyche. Very few, if any, prisons pr in the United States provide prisoners with those things. Prisons are dangerous places to live. There is an unpredictability and an uncontrollability to the danger that prisoners are vulnerable to. And they are punitive places, not only in the sense that all of that happens to you in prison as a result of the punishment that is inflicted on you when you go there, but if you don't handle all of those deprivations and that degradation and that danger in the way the prison wants you to handle it, its response to that is more of that, not less of it. Mm -hmm. So it is an internally punitive environment. It's why we have in this country, in the neighborhood of 100,000 people who were confined in solitary confinement, largely because they were unable to come to terms with the awful dehumanization and degradation and deprivation to which they were subjected, many of them mentally ill and who are responding with their mental illness to the nature of these conditions, but punished nonetheless for their inability to tolerate this extraordinarily harsh environment. So 100,000 people is a big number. Um, and we've seen certainly in the popular press a lot of attention being given now to reform uh, I don't know if it's a movement or some just at least uh, active discussion uh, on uh, solitary confinement. So from your perspective, uh, Professor Haney, uh, taking into account the president's recent statement, uh, our mayor here in New York City is limited uh, solitary on Rikers Island for juveniles. Uh, Greg Marcatel this morning talked about his reforms. National Association is talking about sol So is this real? And is it, is, it, is, it, is it, how do we know whether it's moving? And uh, is it, it going to make a dent in that 100,000? It, it is real. It is going to make a dent in the 100,000, but it is nowhere near enough. Um, and I would say the same thing about prison reform in general, that, that, that what we are doing here today, what, what other uh, uh, organizations and, and groups that you're hearing about are, are doing on the ground and in communities is incredibly important. Um, statements from the president are incredibly important, but we all need to keep in mind, it took us 40 years to get here. This will not change overnight. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, a, a problem of enormous magnitude. Um, it runs deep into the culture that we live in, mm -hmm. and it has to be addressed at that deep level in addition to the level at which it's being addressed now. The people who are making changes in their prison systems, like Greg Markintel, deserve our admiration, but they are a minority mm. of, mm -hmm. of correctional leaders, still a minority of correctional leaders in the country. Just a quick answers, uh, both from Ronald and Andrea, uh, before we hear, to hear from Jorg. What's your, what's your take on the sort of this national mood that solitary is being reduced and we're going to reduce the, the prison population? Does this make you feel hopeful or are you cynical about this, either of you or both of you? What do you think, Andrea? Well, you have to stay hopeful, of course. Um, and there's a lot of uh, really good work, I think, that's going on. And I think the focus we should put on is what's happening from the grassroots, what's happening from out of the communities. Right. And that is not give, that's not receiving enough of attention. A lot of the work so far has been uh, done, or not done, but commandeered, I'm going to say it, commandeered by uh, nonprofits that aren't including the voices of those who are most impacted. And when we do that, we are not creating a well-informed, restructured system. And we have got to create the space for those people who are the experts. We are always brought to speak, and everybody else but those of us who are there, who have, been, have the experience, are described as the experts. We are the experts. <laughs> we are the people who know um, what the changes are that need to happen. Just quickly, Ronald. Right. I, Just, I'm, I'm eternally hopeful and optimistic. I see the silver lining in everything. <laughs> I think that, you know, the, the, the measures are being taken recently right. with the president's, you know, of abolishing right. solitary. I think that's a good thing. It's symbolic. It only affects about, what, 30 prisoners in the federal system? <laughs> but it's, it's a step it's not, in the right not direction. not quite 100,000 yeah. nationally, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction right. because it, it gives um, notice to the states that they can follow suit 
and feel safe about doing it because politicians right. and people to make these decisions are real skittish, but if they see the leaders taking these positions, then they'd be more likely right. taking themselves. So, York, you know the American system to some extent. <laughs> You've been listening to this conversation. We've had uh, discussions over, over uh, beer and Botforst in, uh, in Germany. So, uh, does the experience that's been described by Andrea and Ronald bear any relationship to the German experience for people who are, you have prisons, people in their prisons, uh, in terms of length of time, use of solitary, the conditions of confinement, the relationship to family, just reflect on what you're hearing. I've, I've heard so many sad stories in this morning. It was um, a bit depressing for me, I have to say. So, so much um, um, anger and fear and aggression. And, uh, um, and I, I think, or I ask myself the question, how can anything good come out of it? And uh, what, what's the idea behind it? What about uh, humanity and what about um, chances, second chances, um, and I, on the other hand, I see the ones you talked about, the director generals, the criminologists in the U.S. who want to change something, and I'm, to answer the other question, I, I'm hopeful, yeah. Mm -hmm. The German system is completely different. Um, it starts with a, with a constitution with the first sentence, human dignity is inviolable. To protect it and defend it is the duty of all state authority. So what's state authority? It's our officers. It's definitely, because they have to handle people who are incarcerated. Um, next step is our prison law. And it, our prison law says, uh, by serving his sentence, the prisoner has to be be enabled to lead a life in social responsibility uh, without committing further crimes. And also, it's, uh, it's the protection of the society uh, during the time he's in prison. Then we have three principles. The first principle is the normalization principle. So life in prison should be approximately as far as we can as life outside. The second is uh, the principle of, uh, to be um, that we have to do anything uh, against prison effects, impri imprisonment effects, and the third pr principle is the reintegration principle, the reintegration or resocialization principle. That, have, that means we have to work from the first day, not with the aim to, to create a system inside. The, the, the system inside is the second. We have, to, we have to work that he shouldn't commit any further crimes, no more victims. Um, safety of the society is not the time he's imprisoned. Safety of the society is if this man comes out and he's better than before. So just to make this, um, just put some numbers around it, so what's, what's an average prison sentence in Germany? How long would somebody be in prison for? 10, 12 square meters. Uh, no, how, how long will they, how long? Time. A time. Right. The average time. Um, we have 50% of our prisoners are released within one year. Within one year. Two thirds of our prisoners are released within two years and 90% of our prisoners are re released within four to five years. So wow. A little different. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the incarceration rate in Germany is? Uh, it's um, uh, 79 on 100,000. One so, tenth of ours. Yeah. So prison head plays a different role in society and in the justice system, and sentences are, are much shorter. Yes, so, so we have a, a slide that we're going to put up that is a picture of a cell in Germany. It should be coming up any minute now. So, <laughs> so, so Jörg, just before the skeptics take over, is that a typical cell in, in Germany? It's a, it's a, I think it's a modern prison. It's one of the newer ones, but uh, 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 the interior is uh, comparable to other prisons uh, too. There's this big window. Um, we have, daylight is very important, but not all the prisoners like daylight. Uh, so, um, we have uh, personal items in it. They usually have a small TV. Uh, that's, that's quite normal, yeah. Uh, that's so, that's so I'm just, the normalization I, I told, principle. I told Ronald and Andrea that they couldn't see the slide before <laughs> sitting here. So, any wow. quick reactions? I'm assuming nobody's sharing that. <laughs> no. Oh. Nobody, no, it's that's, a single, that's one. It's a, that's one it's a single cell. Single cell. Yeah. Right. 
Wow. And, what do you think, Ron? Compared to our prison, it's like um, out of a home, home and garden magazine. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, like, wow. <laughs> it's, that's the normalization principle. You, know? right. that's, you see it there. Yeah. So uh, these principles are powerful in, mm -hmm. in Germany and have a lot of uh, operational meaning. Um, but let's just come back to the solitary uh, comparison. So um, you were in solitary for how long? Um, the longest at one time was 18 months. Okay. But I have. I Total spent end 18 to end, months, one end, year, six months. It's been end to end was put it all together. It's right. about three and a half years. Okay. Uh, and uh, Craig, you said you interviewed somebody yesterday on Tuesday who had spent 37 years in solitary confinement right. in the state of Pennsylvania. Now that's not a norm, but it happens. Yeah. So just to give a sense of scale. So your what what are the rules in Germany governing the you have solitary confinement, but what are the rules governing solitary? Of course, we have solitary confinement. It's up to three months per year. Uh, and if, if there is someone so dangerous and problematic that he has to be in solitary confinement longer than three months, the prison needs the consent, the permission of the higher uh, level, that means the, the Ministry of Justice in the, in the state. At any given time, how many people in solitary in Germany? Roughly, uh, longer than three months, you mean? Or no, no, no. Uh, well, let's do, very, let's do very, very few. Very, very few. When the, when the Americans were in our prisons, uh, they always said, oh, let's, let's show, show us your, your solitary confinement units. And, and I think there were no one in it. And they had looked at, <laughs> looked at the books and they said, oh, the last one was here a uh, fortnight ago for three days or five days, something like that. So I, th I think solitary confinement is, we have a re-socialization principle, you know, and not a de-socialization right. principle. <laughs> so, so we're almost out of time, and I want to start with Craig just answering the question we want to leave hanging, because it's, it's too big to answer uh, in the time we have. Why do you think the American system is the way it is and so different from what, we've, what we know in Europe? What, is, what does it say about our character? What does it say about our levels of violence? Uh, and I don't want to leave people depressed, but how do we overcome this? Because we have two people on the stage who are doing work on restorative justice principles, as we would call it, and the healing and the work you did with your, with your son's uh, murder. So there, there are glimmers of hope here, but just take us uh, to the sort of the American character question. Well, I don't, I don't think it speaks to any unique uh, stain in the American character. I do think, though, it speaks to a stain in American history, and that's racism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's impossible to avoid the, the historical fact that the ramping up of mass incarceration began in the United States on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement, and it was very effectively politically exploited um, and has continued to be exploited for 40 years. That's not the only dimension to the mass incarceration movement, but it was a, cr a critical fulcrum point that was used to mobilize anger uh, and to mobilize approval for punishment. Ronald, be you're uh, some lightning round here. Uh, so what, what does this say about, uh, about America? And Jörg, you're going to get to not talk about us, but you can talk about Germany. <laughs> I would just say that, I mean, I would reflect on one of Dr. Martin Luther King's quote. He said, we must learn to live together as brothers or die apart as fools. So I think we need to put the humanity back into being, you know, human. Yeah, great. And to me, that's the overarching message. Okay. So, Jorg, we had a brief discussion downstairs about some of the German history that is relevant to where you stand now uh, in terms of your approach to incarceration. So why is Germany where you are? Well, we changed a lot, and, may, and maybe we learned uh, out of our history, but uh, we, uh, our new constitution from 1949 is completely different uh, to, the, to the years before, and uh, human dignity is a, is a very, very important uh, um, part in it. And um, our officers, they have, they, have a swear, they have to swear an oath on, on, on our constitution. Um, so I think it's very important to think outside, uh, not inside prison systems. Uh, they all have to come back, and you, uh, if we have to, our, our duty is to, to work with them to, 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 um, to have 
to give them second chance, opportunities. And on the other hand, the prisons are safe. We don't have escapes, we don't have attacks against, uh, very, very few attacks against uh, our prison uh, officers and quite few attacks among prisoners. It's calm, you know, calm and working. Andrea, okay. you get the final word here. So you've reflected on the American sort of experience with, with punishment, and what do you think uh, we should know, think about about ourselves? Well, we need to start with just stop incarcerating people for uh, poverty and for the illness of addiction. And we need to stop sending women, particularly mothers, to prison. Right. On that final note, thank you to the panel. Thank you all for coming. And let's go do some work. Okay, thanks. Great.